Hello friends, my name is Randall Warren. I'm the rector of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'm here today with the icon of St. Maria Skobstova, also known as Mother Maria of Paris, and I'd like to tell you her story. The year was 1891. Little Elisaveta Palenko was born to aristocratic parents in Riga, Latvia, then a part of the Russian Empire. As she grew, Elisaveta was very close to her dear father, and he died suddenly when she was a teenager. In her grief and sorrow, she turned to atheism. By the time she was 19, she married a young Bolshevik boy. The marriage only lasted three years, but by the end of that marriage, Elisaveta had a daughter. She was active in Communist Party politics. She was furious at Leon Trotsky for canceling a Socialist People's Congress. And interestingly, she was being drawn to the image of Christ dying on the cross and was thinking about that connection to all of humanity because everyone must die. It was the beginning of her thoughts about religion. Not too long afterwards, she became mayor of Anapa, a city in southern Russia. Shortly after she became mayor, the White Army took control of the region. The White Army was a group that was opposed to communism. So when they took control, they immediately put Elisaveta on trial for being a Bolshevik. Fortunately for her, a former professor of hers, Daniel Skobstov, was the judge of the trial, and she was soon acquitted. Not long afterwards, she and Daniel fell in love and got married. The times were chaotic, and eventually the couple and their burgeoning family found themselves moving to Georgia, then to Yugoslavia, and finally in 1923, settling in Paris. By this time, that marriage too was ending. At this point, she was studying theology and social work, had joined the Orthodox Church, and her bishop, made an interesting, interesting discernment. He took a look at this passionately intelligent young woman, former communist, soon to be twice divorced, multiple children, chain smoking, and he thought, a nun, smart bishop. With some convincing from her bishop, finally, Maria, she took her vows, her monastic vows, and chose the name Maria. It's also interesting to note that she would only take those vows if the bishop promised her that she wouldn't have to live in a convent isolated from the world. Mother Maria soon uh, procured a home in central Paris where she was near to the people with whom she worked. Her home became a place for the poor, a place for the lonely, a place for refugees, a place for intellectual and theological conversation. It was a welcoming, accepting place. She believed, came to believe very deeply, in fact, that in pouring himself out into humanity, Christ had done so with such completeness and such thoroughness that he could be found in every person. She believed that Christianity was not only shaped by a mysticism of our union with Christ, but also by a mysticism of our union with each other. That's part of what made her house such a welcoming, accepting, and open place. By the 1940s, of course, the Nazis took over Paris. Eventually, Jews began to show up at Mother Maria's house uh, to seek baptismal certificates so that they could avoid arrest. So Mother Maria, 
Father Dimitri, the chaplain to the house, and Mother Maria's adult son, Yuri, would help people find their baptism, get them a baptismal certificate, help them find refuge, help them hide if they needed to hide, help them get food, anything that they could do to help all people, not just the Jews, who were in crisis with the Nazis in Paris. Eventually, however, the Gestapo figured out what was happening. And Mother Maria and Father Dimitri and Yuri were all arrested. Father Dimitri and Yuri went to the Dura concentration camp where they were killed. Mother Maria was sent to Ravensbrück, and it's said that on Holy Saturday in 1945, she went to her death in the gas chamber. Witnesses reported that she took the place of a young woman who was distraught and upset because that young woman had been chosen for execution that day. It's a powerful story, a very powerful story. As you meditate on the icon of Mother Maria, I'd like to read for you a few words from her own uh, essays. She wrote quite a bit, and what she had to say was very powerful, just like her life. So have a meditation, a reflection on the icon, and I will read. It was given to each of us to be born, to love, to have friends, to thirst for creativity, to feel compassion, justice, a longing for eternity, and to each of us will be given death. We stand before the truth of the Lord and want to fulfill its commands. And the truth of the Lord tells us that the heavens cannot contain it, but it is contained in the manger in Bethlehem that it creates and upholds the world and falls under the weight of the cross on the way to Golgotha, that it is more than the universe and at the same time does not scorn a cup of water offered by a compassionate hand. The truth of the Lord abolishes the difference between the immense and the insignificant. Let us try to build our small, our insignificant life in the same way as the great architect builds the planetary system of the immense universe. People make a choice between the sorrowful face of Christ and the joy of life. He who rejects the sorrowful face of Christ in the name of the joys of life believes in those joys, but tragedy is born at the moment when he discovers that those joys are not joyful. Forced, Mechanized labor gives us no joy. Entertainment, more or less monotonous, differing only in the degree to which it exhausts our nerves, gives us no joy. The whole of this bitter life gives us no joy. Without Christ, the world attains the maximum of bitterness because it attains the maximum of meaninglessness. Christianity is paschal joy. Christianity is collaboration with God. Christianity is an obligation newly undertaken by mankind to cultivate the Lord's paradise, once rejected in the fall, and in the thicket of this paradise, overgrown with the weeds of many centuries of sin and the thorns of our dry and loveless life, Christianity commands us to root up plow, sow, weed, and harvest. Christianity calls us in the Paschal song, let us embrace one another. In the liturgy, we say, let us love one another that with one mind we may confess. Let us love, meaning not only one mind, but also one activity, meaning a common life. It is necessary to build our relations to man and to the world, not on human and worldly laws, but within the revelation of the divine commandment, to see in man the image of God and in the world 
God's creation. It is necessary to understand that Christianity demands of us not only the mysticism of communion with God, but also the mysticism of communion with man. Let us pray. O creator and giver of life, you have crowned your martyr Maria Skubstova with glory and given her as an example of loving service to the suffering and poor, even to the point of death. Teach us to love Christ with all our being and to love one another in truth and action and to strive against injustice and evil in the world that we may shine with the light of the resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for being with us.